good, amen? He's good all the time, and I know that God has been blessing us with all of the many things that we've been learning through this I Value series, and I thank Pastor for bringing us this way, for the Holy Spirit leading us. Because if you don't know where you're going, you won't know what to tell and share with someone else what's happening uh, in their life or what can happen in their life. We uh, kind of joked around about the, the, the amount of uh, material that we have. Uh, this evening, I have made up some copies, 10 of them out there, so you're gonna have to hurry to get them, of many of the scriptures that are there. Just 10 copies, back to back, two pages, and if you're willing to uh, pick those up and look through those particular scriptures, I may or may not get to some of them or all of them, but you can have them to study on your own if you like. They're there for you on the table just as you're going out the door. We're going to start off our series uh, tonight in the same way we fashioned to continue our series. This is uh, number 14, and Pastor Christian's going to quickly follow me in just a few moments. Uh, to cover 15 and 16 of our 16 fundamental truths of the Assemblies of God. Starting out this evening with 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. The New King James Version says, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Now this evening I'm not going to be, I'm going to be trying to stick to teaching as opposed to doing as much preaching and that's difficult. Selena said tonight the two longest preachers are going to be up here tonight and we're going to try to keep it to the smallest amount. So, uh, <laughs> left you out, Pastor Mike. But uh, it's, it's a blessing to be able to, to share this. Something you don't often hear scripture talked about in uh, the eschatology uh, of the scripture but we're, we recognize that there are four basic cardinal doctrines that we have, and we focused on those, that being, first of all, salvation. After that, the baptism in the Holy Spirit, divine healing, and then some of what we're gonna be talking about this evening, the second coming of Christ. My objective is to share with you the millennium tonight. The millennium, of course, means a thousand. We think about that because of the fact that millennials are, have, have been born, and we hear a lot of talk about that and how to reach the millennials for Christ. The second coming of Christ includes the rapture of the saints, which Pastor Christian covered. The rapture is not a word which is in the scriptures, but the taking away is there, and that's spoken of. It's which our, our blessed hope is there, followed by the visible return of Christ with his saints to reign on earth for 1,000 years. Now, I can't imagine 1,000 years, because we've been in existence for at least a, a, a what, uh, 200, 300 years going on and uh, here in the United States and many more be beyond that and they can figure out what they want. But I'll tell you, I got to really praying about this uh, in regard to sharing the millennium and I noticed there's something that we don't really cover in our 16 fundamental truths that leads up to the millennium and I just want to cover that briefly tonight and that is the tribulation. With the saints removed from the earth, a time of suffering will come upon the whole world. The tribulation is a period of seven years. The seventh week of Daniel, Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, and there's a pastor here in town preaching on Daniel on, the, on Sunday mornings and Revelation on Sunday nights. It's a Baptist church over on our side of town. I said, man, he's got his hands full. I'll tell you what, I wouldn't want to do that for sure. The last half of the tribulation period will be called the Great Tribulation. There is belief about the pre-trib. Some of you may hear about this. Some people believe it. Some people don't in, in certain ways. The rapture will occur before the beginning of Daniel's seventh week. Yes. Mid-tribulation scholars believe the rapture will occur in the middle of the seventh week or before the great tribulation. Post-tribulation scholars teach that the rapture will occur at the end of the 70th week or when Christ comes to set his kingdom up. Now, the reason why we're teaching you is so that you know where we, be where we believe. The common belief, the understanding from what we believe in the scripture, the common belief in the assemblies of God is that pre-tribulation is more accurate. The very best uh, satisfies the biblical teaching that the rapture is always imminent. It could happen anytime and will have no immediate warning or announcement. I almost was gonna put up a YouTube video of a pastor up preaching. He had his Bible in his hand and as he was preaching, he said, Jesus could come at any time. He could come in any, and half of the area was empty. When the youth were up at Indianapolis, I sent them a text and I said, I hope and pray that God wrecks the kids there, that if the rapture takes place, there's not one person left in the room. Amen. That's the kind of thing we need to see. 
We need to see and know that there's not one person going to be left behind. Matthew chapter 24, verses 42 through 44. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would have let his house, would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Mark says the same thing in chapter 13, verses 33 through 37. I'm not going to actually take time to go through that, but on most, one most always be, one must always be prepared. I can't even read, but I'll read it again. One must always be prepared. Can I hear an amen? amen. The post-tribulation position does not retain the as essential scriptural aspect of an eminent unannounced rapture. But we know the Lord Jesus could come at any time. He could come before I even speak the next word. The tribulation directly con concerns Israel and his, uh, his God's judgment for long apostasy. We all know what apostasy means. Abandonment of religious faith and the neglect of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. The tribulation also affects the whole world because of its ungodliness and ill treatment of the Jews. The first half of these seven years will probably be a time of prosperity and acceptance of the Antichrist. We've all heard about the Antichrist. The Antichrist will be here. We don't know specifically for sure if he's here or if he's not. That's not the issue. The issue is whether or not we're ready to go when Christ comes back. But the last half of the period will witness the plagues described in Revelation chapter 15. I thought and I prayed and I said, God, we cannot appreciate the millennium and what the millennium is going to mean to us. The millennium is going to mean so great to us when we realize what we're going to be missing from the seven plagues. We all know about the plagues of Egypt, what happened there when God delivered his people out of, up out of Egypt. But many times you don't hear Pastor Christian and I were talking about the fact we don't usually hear this preached too much as far as eschatology anymore. It, uh, the coming of the Lord definitely is something there, but there's some things that we need to recognize that we don't often hear about. Great and marvelous are your deeds, the Lord says. They held harps given to them by God and sang songs of God's servant, Moses, and of the Lamb. Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the nations. Who will not fear you, Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you. After this, I looked and I saw the heaven, the temple. I saw in heaven the temple. That is the tabernacle of the covenant law. And it was opened. And out of the temple came seven angels with seven plagues. They were dressed in clean, shining linen and wore golden sashes around their chests. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls filled with the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no one could enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. Now, what are those seven bowls? I'm going to go through those very quickly. The very first one the first angel gave out was a bowl that was cast out over the land. Ugly, festering sores broke out on the people who had the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. Secondly, the second bowl over the sea. The sea turned into the sea turned into blood like that of a dead person, and every living thing in the sea died. These are plagues that are going to happen during the tribulation. The church, remember, is already with God in heaven. The church is with Jesus in heaven. We've been raptured. The third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water, and they became blood. Then I heard the angel in charge of the water say, you are just in these judgments, O holy one, you who are and who were, for they have shed the blood of your holy people and your prophets, and you have given them blood to drink as they deserve. And I heard the altar respond, yes, Lord God Almighty, true and just are your judgments. The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and the sun was allowed to scorch people with fire. They were seared by the intense heat, and they cursed the name of God who had control over their plagues, but they refused to repent and glorify him. The fifth angel poured out his bowl, and on the throne of the beast and its kingdom was plunged into darkness. People gnarled, gnawed their tongues in agony and cursed the God of heaven because their pains and their sores, but they refused to repent of what they had done. 
The sixth angel poured out, and remember there's seven, this is number six, poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up to prepare the way of the kings from the east. Now that's preparing the way for the Lord to come back. Then I saw three impure spirits that looked like frogs. They came out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. They are demonic spirits that perform signs and they go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them for the battle on the great day of God Almighty. Look, I come like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and remains clothed so as not to go naked and be ashamed. Then they gathered the kings together to the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. And the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air. And out of the temple came a loud voice from the throne saying, It is done. Have we heard something like that before? Yes. Come on, brother. Then they came flashes of lightning, rumbles, peals of thunder, and a severe earthquake. No earthquake like it has ever occurred since mankind has been on earth. So tremendous was this quake. The great city split into three parts and the cities of the nations collapsed. God remembered Babylon and the great and gave her the cup filled with the wine of the fury of his wrath. Every island fled away and mountains could not be found. From the sky, huge hailstones, each weighing about, listen, a hundred pounds fell on people. They cursed God on account of the plague of hail because the plague was so terrible. There has been much speculation on the identity of the Antichrist, with many world leaders being named for the questionable honor. The church has been experienced embarrassment when predicting uh, Antichrists have died or otherwise passed from the world scene. We thought about that back in the days before I was born when Hitler was there. They all thought he was the Antichrist. And then there was Mussolini, and then there was this one, then there was that one. Ministers of the Assemblies of God generally choose not to participate in speculating who the Antichrist might be, as well as forecasting the possibility that he is already alive. So what we believe, just like I said a moment ago, whether he's here or isn't here, the most important thing is if you are right and ready to go, I don't know about you, but I don't want to see anybody go through any of that. If there's any reason to be ready, it's to know what you're headed for. The second coming of Christ, the event is different from the rapture. The second coming of Christ is the visible bodily appearance of Christ as he returns to the Mount of Olives from which he ascended back to heaven after his resurrection. After the marriage between the raptured saints and the Lamb, that's when in heaven during the tribulation we'll be with Christ. Christ the groom goes forth to calm all of his kingdom. And as he claims them, they will be prepared to ride with him on white horses, followed by the saints also on white horses. I know now why I like horse riding before anything else. Horses are my favorite. And I'm just thankful that I'm going to be on one of those white horses. How about you? Amen. Revelation 19, 11 says, I saw heaven standing open and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called faithful and true. With justice he judges and wages war. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. It will be a sight of great wonder and majesty as Christ descends with his followers to reclaim that which Satan was temporarily wrestled from his hand. The ensuring conflict between the world of righteousness and the world of darkness is called the Battle of Armageddon in Revelation chapter 16. That's right. At the conclusion of that battle, defeated Satan is bound, and Pastor Christian's going to talk a little bit about that later, and cast into the bottomless pit for a thousand years also. So he has a thousand years waiting on him. I heard something just recently about the fact that when God has his eye on somebody, listen to me now, I got to share this right here. When God has his eye on somebody to use him for the kingdom, the devil watches out for him too. Yes. Amen. That's right. So think about it. The closer you get to God using you, the enemy's watching you too. On, Trying to trip you up. Don't go by the way of what he says because his destination is a pit. Ours is a place in heaven. Ours is a place that Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. <laughs> yes. With Satan's influence removed, now we talk about the millennium. With Satan's influence removed from the earth and Christ's reign of righteousness unopposed, the millennium will be a time of unsurpassed glory and perfect relationships. 
References to, to this future time of pre perfection are found throughout Scripture. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 4. In the NIV, he will judge between the nations and will settle disputes of many people. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Come, descendants of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Isaiah 11, verses 6 through 9, the wolf will, I love this one, the wolf will lie, lie, live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down beside the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. A cow will feed with the bear. The young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox, and the infant will play near the cobra's den. The young child will put its hand in the viper's nest, and they will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Amen. Isaiah chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. In that day you will say, I will praise you, Lord. Although you were angry with me, your anger has turned away, and you have comforted me. Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. The Lord, the Lord himself is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. Yeah. With joy, yeah. with joy, yeah. you will draw water from the wells of salvation. Yes. Verse 10 of chapter 35, and Isaiah says, and those the Lord has rescued with will return. They will enter Zion with singing. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them and sorrow and sighing will flee away. Yes. No more sorrow. No more tears. Yes. Awesome. Andre's song, no more tears over there. Yes. Hallelujah. No longer will violence in verse, uh, excuse me, chapter 35, verse 60, I believe that is. I'm not sure if I got the right one or not. 60, 18, that's good. No longer will violence be heard on your land, in your land, nor ruin or destruction within your borders, but you will call your walls salvation and your gates praise. Hallelujah. I think we heard that before from David, didn't we? Amen. Enter into your gates with thanksgiving, into your courts with praise. Hallelujah. Your sun never set again and the moon wane no more. The Lord will be your everlasting light yes. and your days of sorrow will end. Thank you, Jesus. The millennium will last 1,000 years. Then there will be another fine tuning in God's end time to dealing with the earth and its inhabitants before the perfection of eternity begins. Satan will be released. I just put in a thousand years, but he will be released for a little season to test the love, faith, and loyalty of those individuals born during the millennium. Yeah. Still going to be relationships. There's going to be some born during the millennium. The rebellion of Satan and those who choose to follow him will be short-lived. Fire will come down from heaven and devour the opposition. Satan will then be permanently cast into the lake of fire in Revelation chapter 20. Now, millennium is a peaceful time. It's a place where we won't need to have lights like this because the Lamb will be our light. Darkness will be gone. Darkness will be out of the way. The only place there will be darkness is for that one of darkness that will be in the pit. God is merciful. In Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 21 and 22, and, I, and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Ezekiel prophesied, I will take the Israelites out of the nations where they have gone. I will gather them from all around and bring them back into their own land. So what are you hearing? You're hearing prophecy being fulfilled. If you get the news, this is what's taking place. The millennium is about to happen after the rapture takes place and God's bringing his, bringing his people back to the land. I will make them one nation in the land on the mountains of Israel. They will be one king over all of them and they will never again be two nations or be divided into two kingdoms. Zephaniah 3, 19 through 20 says, at that time I will deal with all who op oppressed you I will rescue the lame and I will gather the exiles. I will give them praise and honor in every land where they have suffered shame. At that time, I will gather you. At that time, I will bring you home. I will give you honor and praise among all the peoples of the earth 
when I restore your fortunes before your very eyes, says the Lord. Romans 11 verses 26 and 27 says, and in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come to, from Zion. He will turn godlessness away from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. The millennium is a time of peace. As you heard of the animals lying down, the children shall lead them. In this fashion, as we go into that time of millennium, we are preparing to come back. We are preparing to come before those that, who were in opposition, following after Satan. And as we follow after our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Amen. and come back to over, overcome and throw out of this earth once and for all, the one who had been against us, the main thing and most important thing that we have to recognize that there's a time coming for us too to be judged. A time coming for we who are in his kingdom to be judged. I think as I shared with pastor and I believe with pastor Christian as well, that John Bevere has a tremendous study on that in regard to a story that's available. If you ever want to listen to it, what's the name of that? Uh, the, what was it? Driven by, Driven by Eternity and the name of the, the, the land that, that it's in. I can't remember, but look up. Driven by Eternity is the book. Yeah. Aphabel. Aphabel. Aphabel tells about what we're going to be learning about in regard to the judgments of God for us. Mm -hmm. So as we do that, give your attention to Pastor Christian as he comes at this time. I'll say this is a first, praise God. We can get used to this preaching team, tag team, and amen. So do give me a minute to get rid of these announcements. Um, praise God, I'm gonna do my best to get you out here in a good time, right? So this, this is heavy, guys. I'm not, I, I struggled last night. I was looking over this, getting it typed up, and we're gonna, we're gonna hit final judgment. I told Pastor, um, and I wanna share this. This is, this is a word that I, I got as I was um, preparing but we are gonna do final judgment and then new heavens and new earth. So it's gonna get better. It's gonna get worse, but then it's gonna get better, right? So we, we focus so much on the destination that we've lost sight of the journey. We have focused so much on wanting to go to heaven now that we have lost sight of everyone going to hell. That is the reason we're still here. But the direction I got is the primary emphasis in the final judgment is we have to get our hearts right if we want to see number 16 and be people that help lead others to our future home. We need to stop looking for the escape. We are good. As Christians, we're good. There's not a reason for us to escape. We are the ones helping others out of the fire to find their way. We've got the one with us in the fire. The only escape from death was for Elijah and Enoch. And Enoch went because he was no more. There was no more left of him because of his walk with God. Not that he was raptured to heaven. Not just that literally he was no more. He synced with the Father spiritually. And because of that, he was no more. So when you see that, that he was no more, it's not just he's up in heaven. He wasn't anymore. Hey, if you grab a hold of that, my goodness. My goodness. So it has been awesome being a part of this as we're going through these. Listen, something to encourage with these are not just education, but they're elevation to your faith and revelation to your spirits, right? These should elevate your faith and bring revelation to your spirits. Um, as you know, it, it, the Bible says that in second Peter three, the Lord, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day. That's how he can do the thousand years and 15 minutes. And I can do eternity in about 30 to plus. So amen. So <laughs> praise God. But to me, fundamental truth number 15 is the most sobering. I struggled, I'm gonna be honest, uh, final judgments. You don't hear it a lot preached. I mean, unless you're, unless you're tuned into Jack Van Empey or John Hagee or Perry Stone, you know, you've got your big guys that hit eschatology and you're like, wow, Revelation unveiled, Dr. Tim LaHaye. But the Assemblies of God position on final judgment is this. There will be a final judgment in which the wicked dead will be raised and judged according to their works. Whosoever is not found written in the book of life. Let's stop right there. Stop right there to think, to stand before the Lord and he's going through that book and Christian ain't in there. I mean, that's the worst day in your life in history. Together with the devil and his angels, the beast and false prophet will be consigned to everlasting punishment 
in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So if we can turn, and I appreciate uh, Wayne back there tonight. I know he's got his hands full. I, I'm not going to, there's, I mean, there's too much. Just like Pastor Sam, there's too many scriptures, which is a good thing, right? Yeah. He can't have too much word. But we're going to do our best just to run through. And like I said, there is, if you want my notes, man, listen, I've got, I'm not kidding, probably 100 scriptures that you can, there's plenty of evidence. I mean, no, that I'm, so, I'm appreciative that we're in a fellowship that has evidence. Yeah. We're not just pulling this out of our tail. There's evidence for what we're talking about tonight, right? So, LeVar Burton, you can take my word for it. It's, it's, we can take his word for it. So, Revelation, Revelation, good grief. Romans chapter 1, verse 28. Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved or reprobate mind, so that they do what not ought to be done. They have become filled. Does this sound like anyone in this culture? They've become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. Are we not seeing that today? They disobey their parents. Watch out, kids. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. Oh, come on. They approve of those who practice them. You therefore have no excuse. You who pass judgment on someone else. For at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself because you pass judgment to the same things. Now we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. Yes. Yes. So when you, a mere human being, pass judgment on them and yet do the same thing, do you think you will escape God's judgment? Boy. Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? That's the key, to lead us to repentance. Yeah. But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath. When his righteous judgment will be revealed, God will repay each person according to what they have done. Wow. To those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. Yes. But for those who are self-seeking and reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil. First the Jew, then for the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good. First the Jew, and then for the Gentile. For God does not show favoritism. Wow, wow, wow. Pretty cut and clear there, isn't it? Amen. There's no excuse. Romans 1, there's no excuse. I, I, don't know who, I don't know who God is. There's no excuse. Open your eyes. I mean, I, it's, I, I don't get into debates with people that you know, want to go into the evolution and stuff. Listen, man, that's, you've turned it into a religion. That's not just a t education. That's indoctrination. I believe in the creator. I believe that we have no excuse. Every single person that is alive has no excuse. The sobering reality is this, that unfortunately we as Christians don't like to talk about, and I don't know if because we think we aren't going there, we don't like to talk about hell. Yeah, the church avoids it, guys. They do. And there's a lot of secret friendly stuff that's going on in our culture where they don't want to talk about it. You have a pastor, former pastor of Mars Hill Church, Rob Bell, wrote a book, Love Wins. Doesn't even teach hell anymore. Wow. Really? I remember, I remember his videos, man. He was solid back when he was doing his NUMA videos. I remember youth camp and he's like, Love Wins, him and Oprah, they're passing out. You know, everyone's going to heaven. Everyone's going to heaven. No one's going to hell. God help us. Matthew 7. Chapter, Matthew, Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 23. I don't know how, how, as a Christian, you can read this and not be shaken to the core. Amen. Matthew 7, verse 21 through 23. And I'm good up here, guys, too. I've got my, my phone, so I can, I can move quickly, too. So, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who's in heaven. Many will say to me that day, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, in your name drive out demons, in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Sharon Whitehead had shared a, a post on her Facebook through uh, Charisma Magazine that there was someone that had a dream and they saw like ministers in hell. And I, 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 those, dream, those dreams bother me. Because I don't want to be that guy that is in hell. I don't want to be that guy. 
you understand the accountability that preachers are held to because of you can't lead people astray. I don't understand how you can do the seat. You can't do seeker friendly in this, in this culture. You got to be the word of God. He's going to hold us accountable. He's going to hold every person accountable that confesses to be a Christian. And you're saying something differently than what you're living. If integrity is not part of who you are, that's a scary thing to think because out of that, he says, I never knew you. That knew is the same that Abraham knew Sarah. There was no fruit out of the relationship. There was no pregnancy. There was no, there was no offspring. So I had a relationship with Christ and nothing came out of it. My God have mercy. Nothing came out of it. So I've been in the way for 35 years. That's the problem. You've been in the way, but you haven't been in the way. Man, we got to get a hold of that to get in our hearts. Glory to God. In this culture, in this time, yeah. for such a time as this, for the body of Christ to rise up and say, I will stand up and be counted. Yes, I may be ridiculed on social media, but I'm going to stand up for Jesus. Yeah. Yes, I'll share this video that if you live in sin, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's right. yes. It doesn't shake us to the core. For some, it's just a waiting process. The destiny of the human race, at the end of this life, what will happen to us? We've been asking that year after year after year since the beginning of man, what's going to happen to us? Where am I going to go? The question that nags in you. That's why until you come to Jesus Christ, you can fill that hole with everything you can think of. I lived in, I saw it. I saw drugs go in, saw alcohol go in, saw relationships go in. He won't fulfill it and she won't fulfill it. He's the only one that's going to fulfill it. <laughs> Is it okay to marry? Absolutely. been one of married for beautifully to my beautiful wife for 16 years. It's okay, but listen, you gotta put in first. Yes. The problem is, man, that, that hole, it just, <laughs> Jesus is the only thing that fills that hole and keeps that hole there. Everything just keeps on going through. And that's why I, well, I don't understand why I'm miserable because you, you, have, you haven't met my savior. Let me tell you about my Jesus. But I'm too, I'm too busy sitting on him on Sunday morning. I don't, I'm too busy when I go home, throw him in the closet and I don't take him out until it's time to come back Wednesday night. And then Jesus, it's time to go to church. It's time to go to church. Well, why haven't you taken me to the workplace? Well, that's my workplace. That's a different type of Christian. Wow. 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 Final judgment means final. Yeah, right. We're not exempt from that. Yeah. Well, brother, I'm going to be the judgment seat of Christ. Are you? Oh. <laughs> read, the, read the Bible. That's right. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought. Yeah, that's right. That grabs a hold of my heart. Hallelujah. That God, that you would let pride die in me. Yes. Yeah. Scramble those letters and put die. pride has die in there. I want pride to die. I don't want to listen. That's a scary thing to stand before. We're going to hit Hebrews 10. I, there's verses I can't get away from. Come on. Tell someone that, man. I, how are you so comfortable? I, I, I love the idea of me hugging Jesus and Jesus hugging me. Yeah. I don't like the idea of me standing before him and be like, I don't even know who you are. Oh, but Lord, I've been preaching. I've been serving. Come on now. I don't know who you are. You weren't doing it for me. You weren't doing it for me. At the end of this life, what happened to us? That is one of the most important questions a thinking per person can ask. How great the Bible gives us the answer to relieve that anxiety. The Prince of Peace. I'm in turmoil. I'm stressed out. You gotta meet the Prince of Peace. I gotta let that Prince of Peace get in me. I gotta let that peace resonate. I got. I gotta get. I mean, I'm just tell you. It was a Sunday morning. I was just praying. Lord, rivers of living water. Lord, I'm just, I, I picture like you're in, you're in, I don't know, you're just stirring up the water on the inside, just rivers of living water. It's time to come out. It's time to come out. It's all come out and wash all that stuff out, man. I just, I get so frustrated, you know, because you see the potential where you can be walking and you see the, the problem of where you are walking. Always strive for the potential because Jesus is about potential. Your potential is to be a son and daughter of the most high King. Your potential is evangelism every day. Not just pastor Sam leading EE -E, where every one of us is an evangelist. With, with information like this, we have to be evangelists. We have to be. I can't sit on this. I can't go to work and act like this doesn't mean anything. I can't preach this and never say a word. What happens at death? It's the separation of the spirit and the body. John chapter 11, verse 11. Praise God. After he had said this, he went out to tell them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to wake him up. In verse 13, Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. Death is the wages of sin. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God to eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And everyone dies because everyone has sinned, save two, Enoch and Elijah. 
But even though they come back in Revelation 11, and I'm, I'm going to give my uh, opinion on this, that as the two witnesses, and yes, I believe that Enoch and Elijah are the two witnesses, though some will say Moses and Elijah represent the law and the prophets. The Bible says it's appointed that a man wants to die. Moses has already died. So that's just, that's my opinion. That's not doctrine, but I think that in Revelation 11, the two witnesses, I think it's going to be Enoch and Elijah. But whoever it is, uh, you know, listen, those are the only two in history to not experience physical death. Uh, and I can say, well, their body was translated. Okay, but they're coming back. So, and then they're going to die. So everyone's going to die. Even Jesus died, but he came back. Right? So when we die, we're coming back. That's not it. That's not the end. You're not going to see the end. You know, I'd love to see on my tombstone to be continued. <laughs> Praise God, man. It's just like that. And he died to be continued. <laughs> He's coming back. Praise the Lord. So death is the ultimate manifestation of sin, which we will finally be delivered. First Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 26. I pray that your ears be anointed as fast as my tongue is anointed tonight. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. We are doing good. Thank you for all the help back there, Wayne. Appreciate it. First Corinthians. No, I don't want the Wycliffe study Bible. What in the world is God? Amen. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 26. The last enemy to, put, to be destroyed is death. Yes. Listen, death ain't our friend. No. You come for me. Yeah, but death comes for me. You don't know my daddy. <laughs> you don't know my daddy. You couldn't keep him down. You ain't going to keep me down. Right. Death's going to be cast. I mean, you picture that. I, I, I don't know about you, but I think like personification. So when I think of death, I think of like as a person. You know, the Grim Reaper and stuff, but death would be cast away. Death, the grave, all of it. You're going to the lake of fire. You, the false prophet, the antichrist, Satan, all, you're going in. One lake of fire. It's over. Jesus defeated death in the grave on the cross. Death, in 1 Corinthians 15, death, where's your sin? Grave, where's your victory? Come on now. Jesus took the teeth out of the enemy. The devil has no bite. He has that mean roar, and he gets us kind of surprised. But listen, and we serve a king of kings. We serve the Lord of lords, right? Until the final disposition of things, every, everyone, look to your neighbor and say, everyone, everyone. believer and unbeliever subject to death. The triumph is that death is not final for the believer, but just the beginning. Right? It's not final. It's my short however many years on this earth. This, it's that, it's the, this is the dash. Right now you're living in the dash. You know, you look, I used to landscape and, and weed eat around tombstones when I was a kid. And I, I hated it because you'd see all these sad ones. You can see kids and stuff. And you're just crying. I'm weeding and crying and looking at it. But you see that dash. You got the beginning, the dash, and the end. And we're in the dash right now. Right? So let's make our dash count. Yeah. Make it a good dash. Right? Not just, you know, because it, it's, it's almost like a dash. It's, it's over and pff, you started and it's over. I'm 38 now. Praise, I, last couple weeks ago, I said I was 37. I mean, see how fast it goes? <laughs> praise God. My kid's like, you're really old. And I'm like, man, praise the Lord, man. Ruby, I mean, Ruby's my age. I'll be in my 70s. Hallelujah. So <laughs> glory to God. Hey, I'll be doing the, the, scene, the connections. I'll be going to Golden Corral on Fridays at 11. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So listen. We're moving on, and I love everyone. Don't get mad at me. I see, I see the, I'm not even looking up. I, see, I feel the stairs. So the triumph is, it, so we're going to move on, right? So the lunch lady, the lunch lady. How many of you guys remember the story of the lunch lady? The best is yet to come. Remember the lunch lady, and, and that, at, her, at her funeral, she wanted to be having a fork in her hand. Because she'd always tell, she'd always tell the kids in the desserts, the best is yet to come. So they gave her the fork. So she was in the, in the viewing in the casket. She had the fork. Why? Because the best is yet to come. That's what she would always tell the kids as they're going through the line. And for us, the best is yet to come. This ain't even the best. And we've tasted the Lord and seen that he is good, but this ain't even a close to the glory divine. This ain't even close to a foretaste of the glory divine. <laughs> there is a resurrection of the wicked dead uh, for purposes of judgment. Their ultimate state is eternal separation from God. You know, here's the thing. I don't like pain. I hate it. Pain's bad. And so when we think of hell, we think of the pain. But to be honest, for the Christian, that's not the worst part. The eternal separation from him. When I've done the Psalm 34, verse 8, and I've tasted and seen that he is good. And I can be like Lazarus in chapter 6. Lazarus and the rich man, that rich man looking up and seeing Lazarus and Abraham. And you know that you can't ever be a part of that. That's hell. That's hell. All the other stuff is, is just, I don't want to say insult upon injury, but it's, it makes it that much exponentially worse. Come on. But being separated from him for eternity. When I, when I remember when he changed my life 
And you know, I'm not going to get into the Arminian versus Calvinist debate on, you know, I believe you can lose your salvation. I believe it's a gift and I believe you can choose to reject that gift. I believe that he offers it to me and I can choose it as long as I've got it. But listen, you can turn away from the Lord. Right. I've seen people do it. Well, he's never saved. That's a, that's a haughty place to be. You're in judgment. You're going to say he's never been saved. I've seen the Lord touch him. Amen. That's right. Man, we don't got to get off our, we're, we're up here, man, where Dean James Kennedy would preach 22 feet in the air. We can't be up there, man. I don't know what people are going through. I don't know the struggle that you're in, but I know that my God knows your struggle and I know the Holy Spirit has the answer. He's the one that can get you through all these things. Right. Amen. We will all face immortality, which means a future in which existence is not subject to annihilation. I have friends. I mean, you know what nihilism is. I have friends that actually are nihilists that, and it's basically believe in nothing. Yeah. That's convenient. That's a, that's a great, it's like atheism. That's awesome. That's great. And do whatever you want. No consequences, man. If you're not a Christian, that's a great life to live until you have to give an accountable every knee. They're going to, they're going to take a knee. You can either do it now with a smile on your face during worship, Amen. or you can do it then with tears streaming down your face, knowing that's the last knee you're going to take. Amen. Everybody's going to take a knee. Even if immortality is a future condition beyond the grave, eternal life, Christ's life in us, we have the first installment. How many guys like installments? It's like, I like installments when they're made to me. So I can, you know, not, not me having to pay installments, but I like the installments to me. So th being a Christian is the first installment. That's just a little bit of what's to come. So it's like the first installment, salvation. Boom, here's a download, Holy Spirit download. And the cool thing is he keeps uploading. Yeah. Or he keeps downloading. You just got to keep uploading, yeah. right? He's downloading, you got to upload. Are you connected? Yes. You got your Wi-Fi and not Wi-Fi, right? I want the Wi-Fi. I want to be connected to him. We, got, we have to have that. You got to have that heavenly data link. You got to connect to the Holy Spirit every day. Lord, would you, would you do that? Galatians 2.20. We got to connect to him, right? I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. I no longer live. So that's like Enoch. He was no more. I've been crucified with Christ. So I've already went through that. We're crucified. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith. And the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Thank you, Jesus. Between the time of death and resurrection of the body is the intermediate state. And some have taught, oh boy, psychopaneki. I haven't even heard of that word before. It's called soul sleep. Some teach soul sleep. Where the whole person dies and the soul and spirit go out of existence until called back into existence in the resurrection. Anybody ever heard that before? Soul sleep. Well, they're just, they're just sleeping, you know. Yeah. Well, the Bible says we have some body present with the Lord. I'll be honest, there's a lot of this stuff. I'm delving into it. And I'm like, man, I've heard so many different teachings on just the revelation, you know, opinions, rather. I mean, John had the revelation on the island of Patmos where they tried to kill him and they couldn't kill him. Come on, somebody. Come on. Have a tenacious faith that they tried to kill him. Bull and moon oil, that's fine. I'm not going to die. Jesus said, I'm not going to die. Peter's like, hey, what about him? Hey, you don't worry about him. You worry about you. I got John. You <laughs> Keep you, stay in your lane. What about this guy? Don't worry about him. You stay in your lane. That's the problem is we get off track. We start looking this way. He says, walk this way. You're looking this way. That's where the devil gets you. He go, you put those blinders on. You say, you know what? Stay in your lane. Go looking over here. Man, look what they're doing. Can, when you compare, it destroys your contentment. And godliness with contentment is great gain. But I don't know about you, but I want great gain in my life. And great gain in my life is being content in all things. Not have an attitude of complaining. I want to do less and less of Revelation 21.8. I don't want to look like the, the vile and the cowardly and the unbelieving and the greedy. And Listen, we've got to shed those things. We can't be that way. The final judgment for the Christian, judgment seat of Christ. God have mercy. We're going to get through this. The account of the rich man. We'll back up for a minute. So soul sleep. Yeah, it goes out of existence. So anyway, the Bible teaches a conscious existence. When Moses and Elijah appeared with Jesus at the Mount Transfiguration, they were still Moses and Elijah. Okay, it's not, they weren't reincarnated of, that was, you know, Aaron and, you know, I don't know, some you know, Malachi or something. That was Moses and Elijah. The account of the rich man and Lazarus points in the direction of consciousness for the departed. Luke chapter 9, verse 28. About eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, John, John, and James with him and went up on a mountain to pray. How many think that's good to go up to pray? Yes. As he was praying, the appearances of his face changed and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Wow. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glory splendor talking with Jesus. 
They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring in fulfillment to Jerusalem. Amen. So, and from the cross, Jesus promised the thief, Luke 23, 43, today you'll be with me in paradise. Man, to be that guy up there. Man, and I, honestly, I'm not just saying this because I'm a Christian, but I, I look at the one guy and I'm like, how can you? He's like, well, if you're the son of God, why don't you come down and take us all down? Why would you say that? I just, I don't get that perspective. I'm the other guy. I'm like, man, hey, if you're going, man, please remember me. Right. And just rem remember me. It's Jesus, I, remember me. I'll do better than this. Today you're going to be in paradise. Come on, somebody. Glory to God. If he could dance, he would dance. He was probably... <laughs> I mean, glory to God. I don't know what you do, but man, the son of God saying that to you, miracles are taking place. Today, I'm going to be with you in paradise. He's going to be with him. Glory to God. The best words in history right there, guys. We have become selfish and have kept this for ourselves. We need to keep this in the forefront of our minds. The apostle Paul reflecting on death indicated that to die would mean ushered at once into the presence of the Lord. David talks about where the, de the godly dead will go. Psalms 23 and verse 6. Glory to God. Psalm chapter 23. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Goodness and mercy will follow you Amen. all the days of your life. I pray that over my kids. I pray that over myself. Goodness and mercy follows me everywhere I go. They're right behind me. Wisdom. I tell you, I'm serious, man. You get in your car and you could have church because you got wit, goodness and mercy following you. You got wisdom crying out in the street. I mean, glory to God, man. You, there's no reason why I shouldn't have wisdom, goodness, and mercy everywhere I go. Because wisdom cries out in the street. I'm like, hey, you need wisdom? Absolutely. I need you every day. Come with me. Amen. So I got wisdom, goodness, and mercy every step. Amen. Man, that's something. Come on. The meaning of the Hebrew term Sheol is debated. How many of you guys have ever heard Sheol? Some take it as the grave. Others interpret it as the place between death and the resurrection. In most contexts, Sheol is something to be avoided. Uh, and I, we're not going to palm up, but Psalms 9, 17, Proverbs 15, 24. The destiny of the wicked in contrast to the destiny of the righteous. Jacob spoke of going to Sheol to his son, Joseph, where he thought him to be dead. Some later, sometime later, rabbis decide there must be two compartments in Sheol, separated by a hand breath or even a finger breath. But Luke 16, 26 declares that there is a great unabridgeable space between the fires of Hades and the place where Abraham and Lazarus were. So in the New Testament, the Greek word Hades is substituted for Hebrew, Sheol, and Hades in the New Testament is always a place of punishment, right? So Hades, we don't want any part of. Hades is bad. It's not good. And the problem is it's also a place of conscious existence and torment. This is the reality. The sober reality is there's going to be torment. The final judgment is final for the person that has not asked Jesus Christ to come into their life. It's not just, I accept you, Lord. It's, I'm committing you to be my Lord and my Savior. I don't, I, listen, I, I get the ABC of salvation. He doesn't need to be accepted, <laughs> right? It's not, because the problem is we portray it that way. We portray it as, well, if you just say a prayer, everything's going to be okay. No, everything's actually not going to be okay. Because when you say that prayer, now, now the enemy takes notice to, this guy is not in my camp anymore. So now he's a target. Because if getting with the right teaching and the right doctrine, he will become dangerous. We, we want to be fugitives on the enemy's list. We really do. And that is dangerous, but he's a greater protector. So whatever he throws at us, we've got the shield of faith, right? He shoots his arrows and the shield of faith and it sticks to it. And we've got the armor and we're surrounded because he's our rear guard and he goes before us. So we're covered. Yes. Every step of the way we're covered. If by faith I believe that and I don't freak out and I go into berserk mode and you know, like tonight, I didn't know when I was going to make it. Our car wouldn't start in my driveway. Are you kidding me? We knew we were having battery trouble. I'm not getting right before. So I drove my work truck in my yard, started my car. So I may need a jump after church tonight. So praise God, but I'm going to get home, right? So praise the Lord. We keep moving. The new Testament does make it clear that there is a hell. How many of you guys heard the word Gehenna? So they taught Gehenna. Some believe the people that say there is no hell, they say that Gehenna is, was a, and it, it was a trash dump outside Jerusalem. But Gehenna translated, it's more than just the trash dump. There's a literal lake of fire and brimstone. Yep. Yeah, keeps burning. It's a real place where the devil and his fallen angels will go. The Antichrist, the false prophet, and those that have not called on the name of Jesus Christ. 
describes it as a lake of fire torment. Hades in the Greeks was a shadowy place. You remember the Greek, the Greek quote unquote gods, Hercules and Zeus and all that. And Hades was kind of the, you know, the river sticks and you put coins on the eyes and you got to do this going across the, the Greek river and all that mythology stuff. But listen, Jesus is real. Amen. We're not mythics in here tonight. Amen. We don't serve a, a fallen Greek or Roman God. I serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Caesar bows. Every Caesar would bow their knee to Jesus Christ. But this is a subject sometimes we naturally turn away from because it's grim. Because we don't like talking about things that are sad. All right? We love talking about the joy of the Lord and sing and, sing and shout and dance about. And we like to be excited about those things. But listen, hell is real. Amen. And what are we doing with it? Because hell's not going anywhere. And there's more people going to it every day. And that challenges me in my faith. Okay, no, I can't proselytize on the work, the work clock, but I can be Christ to people. Amen. I don't have to be a jerk. That's right. right? That's right. And I, I want to, I want to give some correction. If you say, well, well Pastor Christian, I don't have a filter. That doesn't give you a right to be a jerk to people. That's right. Okay. If you're a Christian, everyone has a filter. It's called the Holy Ghost. <laughs> the Holy Ghost is your filter. So before it gets here to here, process and let him deal with it. I sit on it. If I'm getting ready to say it, I sit on it. I got a, I got a friend of mine. He calls me every time. He's like, what would Christian do? I like, don't say what would Christian do. What would Jesus do? But I just, I'm careful about what I'm going to say. Cause I know I'm going to have to cross this way again. So be very careful with the things we say. Plus you're not giving a good recommendation. You're not giving a good witness. And that's without, a Christian without a witness isn't a Christian at all. That's right. I mean, it's just the truth. So this is this it's grim. It's sad. But God could not be the holy God he is without providing an appropriate place for those who have chosen to rebel against him. Right? right. right? You make your choice. You make your bed, you're lying. You make your eternal choice. Jesus, I'm going to choose to follow you. And the sad thing is a lot of people have given their eternal destiny away because they've been offended by Christians. The, man, the offense has just, it's robbed so many people of eternity. Guys, and listen, it, 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 as the Christian, the responsibilities in your court, if you know people's offended you, go to them. If you've offended someone, go to them. It gets you coming and going. We don't have an excuse. That's if right. there's ought against someone, listen, man, lay the pride down. Maybe be the bigger person. Take the high road. Man. You have no idea what that's going to do. You have, man, I, I've got testimonies of people saying, man, I just, I didn't think anyone would say that. If that's what being a Christian is, I don't want to be one. Holy moly. Let that not be a testimony of any Christian that goes to Oakville Christian Center. Amen. Let that not be a testimony of any of us. So just as hell is real, so is heaven. It is the home of those who are children of God, a place in the very presence of God himself. Man, let's talk about the judgments real quick. We're going to run through these. Praise the Lord. Hebrews 9.27 speaks of the coming time of accountability. Hebrews chapter 9. Verse 27. Just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment. It speaks of the coming of the time of accountability when all will stand before the Lord to give an account to what they've done in their lives on earth. Everyone will give an account for what they've done. No second chance, no reincarnation after death. The scriptures do not teach. However, there will be a single sing general judgment of everyone. The Bible does not always does not give the time in between the resurrections or between the judgments. But there is revelation that shows four episodes of judgment. Number one, the judgment seat of Christ. That's for believers only. That's going to be not a judgment of sin for the believer by accepting Christ as Savior has had his sins judged at the cross. Already. This judgment is a matter of rewards for stewardship. So what we do for the Lord does matter, right? Number one, it's with the right motive. Why do I do what I do? Do I do what I do for recognition so people can look up to me and have that? Listen, that's nonsense. That's not why we do what we do. We do it for him. I can honestly tell you that I would act the same if this was empty and just me preach. It'd be exactly the same. I've been that person. I've God, Lord. And I've said that, I mean, I had people, I remember being young and calling me out. And I remember being by myself. I said, Lord, I'll, I'll, I'll do anything. I said, I'm here. It's just you and me. No one's watching, right? You got to have this real moments with God. There's no audience. No one's clapping. On. Our mission should be to get out as much of the gospel as possible. Amen. And I fail every day. I know I do. Because sometimes we got to open our mouth. Here it is. Sometimes we got to talk. Yeah. Man. Sometimes, man, you got to, you got to, you look for that in, you know, and there's, you look for the in. You build the relationships. Can't tell you how many salvations come under relationship building. Right. 
People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care, right? So just, amen, the judgment seat of Christ. So that's a matter of rewards for stewardship on earth. It's a system of rewards as part of Christ teaching about the hereafter. Um, Paul points to that in 1 Corinthians 3, that all believers are building an edifice, some of permanent material, gold, silver, and precious stones, some of impermanent material, hay, wood, stubble. And the fire then burns it up, and what's left? Lord, I offer at your feet. I cast my crowns to you. Everything we give, we give right back to Jesus. Because everything that I did, I did for him, and it's his anyway. It's not mine, right? We don't do it to, man, we've got to be careful, because it's so easy to fall into that. It's so easy to seek. There was a, there was a, uh, there was a post I think Evangelist Burton shared about, you know, about affirmation for man uh, today. You do, what are you do? Why do you, kinds, why do you do what you do? It's so easy to get wrapped into. I do the things so that I'll be encouraged. It's not about that. No. Right. Every, I know we have needs. Everyone has, we have love languages and we all like to be loved and that's, that's great, but I want to do everything for him. Come on. Come on. Cause there's judgment. Judgment's coming. It's not just coming to this world and this country. It's coming to every one of us That's right. That's right. to stand before the Lord. Our deeds will be judged. Number two, before whom do believers appear for this judgment? Revelation 1, 13 through 7, it shows the triumphant uh, Christ. So we will stand before the Lord as John saw him in Revelation 1, a triumphant Christ. Who's, that wasn't the Jesus that he walked with. Right? The Jesus he walked with, you know, I, I picture him just kind of, I don't know, jokes and hey, you know. But I mean, that Jesus was... Eyes, you know, fire and hair, white and bronze. I mean, just that Jesus, he fell as man dead at his feet. And he walked with him for three years. That's his triumphant Christ who we stand before. Not Jesus in the manger. Come on, yeah. <laughs> the King of kings and the Lord of lords. In view of the responsibility and trusted believers as stewardship of precious opportunities, it's necessary that we subject ourselves to judgment so that we will not come under later judgment. So we've got to listen to the gentle urging of the Holy Spirit. I want him to deal with me now rather than deal with me later. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Right? That, that nudging, that, you know, if, not, if we're not getting that nudging, we can talk to you afterwards. There, there can be a nudging. If you're like, I don't feel anything, then let's pray. Yeah. Because you can. Yeah. You can feel that conviction that. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's a gentleman. He's not banging at your door. Condemnation. He's like, hey, remember that thing we talked about Sunday? Yeah. It's Wednesday. Yeah, I know. It's Friday. Okay. He's just, he's consistent because he cares about you. He cares about you. There also be a judgment for Israel. Um, Isaiah chapter 43 and verse, we don't have to go there, but just Isaiah chapter 43 talks about that in Romans nine and 11. So before the millennial restoration, there must come a time of suffering. He, pastor Sam talked about with the tribulation, there will be a judgment of Israel. Israel will break that stiff neck. Yes. That, that stiff neck will turn. And they will recognize that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. Over the 115 messianic prophecies that he alone fulfilled, Christ is Messiah. Amen. We pray for Israel. We love Israel. There will be a judgment of angels in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 3. And some interpret the parable of Matthew 25, 31 through 46 as a separate judgment of the nations after the battle of Armageddon upon the revelation of Jesus Christ. So Satan's final rebellion. After Christ's millennial reign, Satan will be released for a short time. So we imagine that a thousand years, no devil. Yeah. Man, that sounds good. Can't wait. Gonna be great. Thousand years, no devil. But the scary thing is, it says that more will turn, because it talks about Gog and Magog. Can you remember that? So more will leave and follow him. Even after a thousand years. You want to see what deception is? Right there. How is that possible? You've lived in harmony for a thousand years. A millennium. Come on. I can't even fathom a hundred years, let alone a thousand. Yeah. But a thousand years with no devil. He's released. And God probably allows this for another evidence that his justice is righteous. It's a terrible thing to throw people in the lake of fire, which was prepared for the devil and his angels. We are not even meant to go there. Right. We weren't meant for that. Right. <sighs> we were meant for so much more. We were meant to live in perfection. Yes. But the devil. But his time's going to end. Amen. And it talks about, and, and, they, and, and Jesus makes a spectacle and says, this is who deceived mankind? This? This is who deceived them? Because he's the father of lies. His mouth is moving. You know he's lying. He's good at what he does. He studies us. He knows. He finds that weakness and he hits it. 
went and saw a box movie there or not, and just, you find that weakness and you hit it and he just finds it. Oh, broken rib, bust it again, bust it again. He don't stop. He's not a gentleman. He don't care about how you feel. Why do we give in to him so easily? Sin. On, it's all going to end. The sin. Say to your neighbor, the sin is going to end. It would seem reasonable that if people could only know how wonderful the reign of Christ, that they would all believe and follow him. But the devil deceives. So the release of Satan shows that even a thousand years of peace, they will still follow the devil. But then Satan will be cast in the lake of fire. So the great white throne judgment, one of the scariest judgments, one of the scariest places in all of history. Is before the great white throne judgment. The throne is the Father's. Jesus declared that the Father judges no one, John 5, 22. So the majesty of Christ, the majesty of the Father in judgment appears that the present and earth will flee away. There will be no more place in God's plan for them. The way is made for the creation of a new heaven and new earth. Those who appear before the great white throne judgment are the dead, great and small, Revelation chapter 20, verse 12. The righteous take part in the first resurrection. So we already have our new bodies, right? So we're already good. We have our new bodies now living and dead, the dead who stand before the throne to be judged must be the rest of the dead. They did not have their part in the resurrection life at the time of the rapture. So we talked about that in week third, or the fundamental truth number 13, that the trumpet sound of God, the dead in Christ will rise, yes. right? We'll be caught up, harpazo, rapture, we'll be caught up with the Lord. Come on now. They, so those standing before the great white throne judgment, they are the wicked dead. Not just dead, you're the wicked dead including those who were killed off after the millennium and chose to follow Satan. For the judgment books are open. The wicked will be then be judged according to what they have done. Then the book of life is opened. And the book of life is opened. <laughs> and you want your name in that. Amen. You don't want him combing through. <sighs> M-M-M-E-R-A. Words can't even describe what that would feel like. Here's what's bad. This is what upsets me. It's one thing for someone that has never been a Christian, no one that has, but for eternally frustrated to stand here. I can't fathom a pastor or a minister, or a Christian going to hell. It, it, it's almost mind boggling because of what we've tasted. And we trade it for what? For this? I said, I'm not, can I say it last night? And just tears. I'm like, I, I don't even know what to do with this God. Cause that, if that doesn't shake us to the core, nothing will. We just pass it off and be like, well, that's fundamental truth. We're done. Let's get back into talking about something else. This need, I mean, this is why revelation, this needs to be looked at every day. So, I don't care if it's a devotion, something's coming to the forefront of my mind that I'm thinking about hell and not avoiding it, not doing like the, you know, it's like the tackler in the football, oh, I misdirected him. <laughs> no, I mean, I got to look at this and say, this is real. Yeah. My neighbor's going there. Right. I had a neighbor, 62 years old. I didn't talk to him much. He died of a heart attack in his basement. Just saw him walking his dog the day before. I didn't witness to him. I say, hey, Gary, you want to go to church with us? Family's Catholic. Probably, here's what happens. They probably won't listen anyway. So this is what the devil does. He's saying, he's already got a scenario created. Yeah, you're probably right. You're right. He won't listen to me. That's right. By the way, he works. No one will ever listen to you. Right? So the book of life is open as a witness to the fact that they were not among those who placed their faith in Jesus Christ. The great white throne judgment. No opportunity for a second chance after death. That's why our lives are to be geared to the strategic task of evangelism, being ambassadors for Christ. Why? Because John 14, 6, Jesus is the way, the truth, and life, and no one comes to the Father but through him. Right? Oh, so after the witness of the book of life, that their names are not included, the wicked are thrown in the lake of fire. All of it. The death, the second death, that's the final separation. It's not just the first, but it's the second. Yeah. Worship team, you can come, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through, go through quick. Death and Hades will be thrown in the lake of fire. That is death and Hades. We'll have no more part in the new creation, but we merge with the second death. Remorse, bitterness, frustration, death, and judgment will not change a sinner's nature. Only the blood of Jesus can do that. So those thrown in the lake of fire will be tormented day and night forever. God's, it's God's will that none should perish, but all come to repentance. That's his, that's his will. No sin is worth your relationship with Christ. No sin. No person and no thing is worth your relationship with Jesus Christ. 
He's not, she's not, they're not, it's not. Nothing. Nothing. It feels so easy to sin because maybe there's nothing or no one to convict. Wow. Scriptures like that ought to shake us to a core. I want to share Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26 through 31. This next to Matthew 7 is probably, I, I would say for me, the scariest scripture that I've come upon. Um, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and a raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that was sacrificed for them, and who has insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, it is mine to avenge, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It's a dreadful or fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Yes, amen. <laughs> it's right there. I mean, it's, this is stuff being made up. I mean, this is scripture and this is serious. Yeah. This is something that to, we have to evaluate our lives. Where are we, right? I, I think there needs to be a, a, a evaluation every day of my life. I'm not, and not just, well, thank God I'm not where I used to be. Man, I gotta be, get, I wanna be going closer to him. Right? I want to I be going closer to him. Final judgment is final. And I'm a, you don't have to pull it up, brother, but Philippians 2, chapter 5 through 11, it talks about that every knee, that the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Everything under the earth, above the earth, all over the earth, everything will bow at the name of Jesus. Right? Every sickness bows, and so cancer bows at the name of Jesus. Sickness, diabetes, muscular dystrophy, ALS, all of it, all that garbage bows at the name of Jesus Christ. Just before his death, W.C. Fields had a friend visit him in a hospital room and was surprised to find him thumbing through a Bible. Asked what he was doing with the Bible, he said, I'm looking for loopholes. It isn't that our culture today. I'm looking for a way out. So in closing on final judgment, and I'm gonna speed through a new heavens and new earth, my first pastor mentor, who's now Eastern Region Superintendent, Broughton Bible Churches, had shared a message on things in hell we need in our churches. Number one, a clearness of sight. Lazarus, the rich man of Lazarus, man in hell saw Lazarus, a cry of supplication. He cried out to fight, Abraham, can you just dip your finger in water and touch my tongue? A con there was a, a consciousness of suffering. We have to be aware that there is suffering. There's gonna be an eternal suffering, a completeness of separateness, that once you're in there, you're not getting out. Hell is final and hell is real. A concern for sinners. The man in hell was concerned for his brothers and asked him to send him back to reach out to his brothers the correct way of salvation. And he told them that. So I'll, finishing up Revelation chapter one, listen, it's going to get good. It's going to get good. So according to the promises, new heavens and new earth, the apostle Paul relates an experience of being caught up. There's the first heaven, which is the atmospheric heavens. How many guys like astronomy? Not astrology, not tarot cards and all that nonsense. Astronomy, the plants and the stars. So there's the atmospheric heavens surrounding the earth. There's number two, the starry heavens. And number three, the third heaven where the throne of God is. It says he was caught up in the third heaven. He related as paradise. What did Jesus tell to the thief on the cross? Today you'll be with me in paradise. Both the Old Testament and New Testament speak of a new heavens and a new earth. Revelation chapter 21 and verse one. I saw the holy state of the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. Do you know that we're the bride of Christ? Amen. He's the bridegroom, we're the bride of Christ. Amen. Some believe that there will be a renovation of the present heavens and the earth rather than new creation. The Bible talks about, for example, everlasting hills, Habakkuk 3, 6. And the earth established forever remaining. But in the word in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 10, says that this earth will disappear or pass away. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. So and disappear with a roar, not with a hush or a whisper, but with a roar. That Greek word is paralucentai. Sometimes it means to pass or pass away, to pass through, but also means to come to an end. It means this earth is coming to an end. The new heavens, the new earth, they're coming in and this is disappearing. The word translated destroyed or melt is Greek is Luthus die means to unloose, untie, break bonds or seals, but it's also tie, use of a ship breaking up and being destroyed. It's also in 1 John 3, 8, where it talks about the devil 
being destroyed, but we destroy the works of the devil to make loose the works. And then the Greek word teketai in 2 Peter chapter 3. We're getting a lot of Greek, aren't we? We're going to get through. Verse 12 means to melt away and confirms that the earth, the stars, and the plants will be destroyed. So it's all going to be destroyed. Everything that we know. There is a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is what? He is a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. So just as we are new creations, there's going to be a brand new, previously unknown. It talks about things like this. Previously unknown, not previously present or unheard of. May we be like the new heaven and new earth and be the Christian that's unheard of. Amen. Amen. And a new covenant is coming. Different, entirely different than the one given on the Mount Sinai. It's going to be used of the new Jerusalem, which already exists in heaven and comes down. Therefore, clearly not present. Jerusalem renovated. And I joked about maybe I could be a heavenly locator. If they're renovating Jerusalem, maybe I can do some locating. But I think of renovation, that's where my mind goes. But it's going to be the marvelous new one coming in. It's not just renovating like as you renovate a building, but a whole new heaven and a whole new earth. It's going to be passed away. In Revelation 21.1, the Greek word for passed away is apelthon. And it's used of going away, passing from one condition to another. But it's also used of leprosy leaving. So since fire is often used in the Bible, cleansing or purifying, it may be taken that the heavens and the earth are renovated. So how many know, guys, that God is doing a new thing? If you stand to your feet tonight, God's doing a new thing. Peter prophesied that this world would come by fire. The earth was flooded and a fire's coming. How many know what happened when matter and antimatter come together? An electron and a positron come together. There's a flash of energy going off as heat, then nothing. That's how it's described as a new heaven and new earth. People say the big bang, Barry, the big, it, God spoke bang and happened. Yeah, I believe God spoke and bang. There it is, right? However, God does it. The disappearance of the present earth and heaven will make way for new ones. There will be no more sun, no more moon. We'll have our new bodies, immortal and incorruptible. John in the island of, on the island of Patmos gives details about the vision, the new heaven, and the new earth. There'll be no more sea, no more environment. I don't need oxygen anymore because I'm, I'm reborn. I'm a new creation. I want to close with this. The new Jerusalem is going to be 1,380 miles. That's from like Evansville, Indiana to Helena, Montana. How I many know oh my God does things big? He don't do it small. You could fit 1,300 earths in Jupiter. Or you can fit 1.3 million Earths in the sun. Then there's the big dog star, Canis Majoris. You can fit three quadrillion, 729 trillion Earths in it. Won't God do it? That's how big our God is. He's not a small God. He don't do things little. The New Jerusalem described like a cube. So for the Star Trek fans, that's not the Borg, okay? The Borg's not coming. It's a cube. God doesn't work that way. Resistance is futile. You'll be assimilated. God wants everyone in. So as our hearts are preparing... I want you to think about this, that the effects of sin will never be felt again. He will wipe away every tear and he'll wipe away every spot. Amen. He will wipe away every tear and every spot in Jesus' name. You'll never be sick again. Amen. We'll experience the full consummation of what Jesus paid for us. He'll swallow up death in the grave. Inside the walls, pure gold. The most beautiful thing we've ever seen. It talks about Jasper. And I, I'll let you read Revelation 21. But listen, it's so beautiful. And it's going to be so good. There's no temple in the city because the whole city is filled with the glory of the presence of God. There's no need for a temple. He is the temple. The whole city, his glory, his presence is everywhere. That's where the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit will be. Jesus will personally be the lamp, the source, the transmitter of light and energy. He will be the renewable energy source. Can I get an amen? Right? Forget Vectrin. You got Jesus. We've been waiting for. Get your solar panels out because you're going to get the sun, S-O-N. So listen, with the tree of life, it's going to be good. I want to encourage you now with your eyes closed. I know we ran through this quick. Thank you for listening. Uh, man, Just I, I want you to prepare your hearts as we've gone through these. Um, can I encourage you to stay close to Jesus? Can we stay close to Jesus? Every knee will bow. Can we do it now joyfully rather than later painfully? Because listen, the new heaven, new earth is going to be a place of surpassing beauty, a fullness of knowledge, activity, a place of rest from frustration and toil to mold, no more suffering, loneliness or heartache. This is what's in store for us, but we're not there yet. We're here right now. And we have, we have people that we come in co contact with these 
fundamental truth, these 16 fundamental truths that we've went through this entire year. They're not just for education. I really felt that was a word from the Lord. They're not just for education, but they're for elevation and revelation. So if there's anyone, I want to open up these altars. If you just feel like, listen, I, I want to encourage all of us to make, and I'm going to make a fresh commitment to say, you know what, from fundamental truth number one to the scriptures inspired to number 16, the new heavens and new earth, everything in between. Lord, I want to make a fresh commitment to you tonight. I want to commit my life to you, Lord, that I will, that I will keep on the forefront of my mind what it means, Lord, to have the scriptures inspired, to have a relationship with the one true God, to understand the deity of Christ, to know that I've been in the fall of man. Every single one of them. From divine healing to the blessed hope, every single one of them. I want to encourage you just to make a fresh commitment to say, you know what? I'm going to live these out. It's not just Assembly God Fellowship <coughs> jargon. This is based on the Word of God. We've given you probably a thousand scriptures to base evidence on. This is real. So if there's anyone would like to, as we, as we worship, I just want to encourage you to come up. Just make a fresh commitment. God, I'm going to serve you. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to keep this on the forefront. Lord, I want to, it, it, maybe I'm in an area in my life where I'm not where I need to be. Man, we're here to pray with you. If there's anything you need, Pastor Sam, Pastor Mike, Pastor Ken, me, any of the prayer team, Glenda, listen, we're here to pray with you. And let's just, let's leave better than we came in in Jesus' name. Amen.